just uh, having written this short book on artificial intelligence and its uh, limitations um, myself, I've op opened up Eric Larson's book uh, with some trepidation and with the assumption that uh, I would uh, disagree with much of it. But I found that he anticipated most of my points and really wrote a brilliant and incisive critique of the ultimate uh, possibilities of a singularity or a artificial intelligence as a superhuman capability and all these other uh, ideas that I think are uh, eroding the ideological a world of Silicon Valley. I mean, if you really think that you can uh, uh, succeed in business by obsoleting your customers and your workers and your creators, uh, you're not going to succeed. And, uh, and uh, so welcome Eric Larson and his excellent book. Thanks. Appreciate it. It's good to find a new here. Well, actually, I've never met you in person before. Well, it's actually good to, to meet you, yeah. I'm actually thinking about the next book, and so it's really challenging for me to recapitulate the arguments for the myth, um, the, the book, The Myth of Artificial Intelligence. Um, and so, so I'm going to... I'm going to do this backwards, basically, and describe what I'm thinking about now and then we can get into the book I wrote. Um, and I did my best in that book to just lay out the argument that we're not on this path that's inevitable, right? Like we need innovation if we're going to get to general intelligence, if that's a laudable goal or not, that becomes a kind of moral question and becomes a very large picture idea whether we want to develop tech that's actually uh, generally intelligent, like people are, right? So, but if we're going to do it at all, we're gonna have to have these real uh, expansions of innovation. And, you know, the, the, the data stuff we're doing now, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun, but it's not a path at all. And uh, there's a lot of confusion about that, so I wanna make sure that I describe that, but so, my next project is a history of the 21st century so far. And um, I think there's basically three really big things that have happened in 21 years. Um, the first was 9-11, uh, and that created a huge expansion of data. Uh, the collection and analysis of data by the NSA and the CIA. I work for the Department of Defense. I can't say anything bad about them, don't worry. <laughs> um, but um, uh, that, that event um, created a tidal wave of data centralization, which actually led in, which, which also sort of led into the narrative, the building kind of narrative of AI. The second was the collapse of the stock market in 2008. Um, that was an also um, very much a story of what happens when Moore's Law uh, continues. So we, we've had uh, Moore's Law going on since Gordon Moore originally voiced the idea that every 18 months we double. That was going to create a sea change in the culture. It was just inevitable that we have more computing power every year and a half. You know, I just get a little fatter and a little grayer every year and a half, and the entire computer industry doubles. <laughs> and that, that's, that's going to have massive effects. Um, we didn't really see those until the 21st century, though, actually. It finally, that exponential curve actually hit us in the 21st century. And so the first thing we had was... Um, a, a centralization project that was very, very understandably started with concer security concerns. The second thing we had was a complete collapse that nobody saw coming seven years later. And the third thing we had was a new marketing spiel for AI that started in 2012 
roughly, you can date it to um, uh, AlexNet is a name of an image recognition program, and it was uh, it it uh, scored 11 or 12 points higher than any system to date, and. Um, this is George Gilder, wherever you are, George. This is your point about uh, this is your point about Moore's law. There was no innovation, actually. That was Moore's law finally cashing its uh, cashing its chips. So um, it's very frustrating. I work in natural language processing, and um, it's very frustrating because the 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 best thing that you have always is somebody has a great idea. And I don't want to take anything away from the Toronto guys. Um, they actually came out of Canada, believe it or not. There's this huge country right above us that nobody seems to know anything about, and they're very smart up there. And, um, and so, um, but they, they, they kind of, uh, they took a very old technology and they just basically stacked it on top of each other and they used Moore's Law to create the biggest surge of market forces that we've seen in a very long time. We're still living in the shadow of that, that market surge from quote unquote deep learning. But we've made almost no progress on the substantive issues uh, for intelligence. And it's very, it's very curious to me how very smart people can just completely not see that. And it's it's very obvious actually that that uh, you know we 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 are able to reverse engineer. If you get a team of engineers, um, you can say let's play the game of Jeopardy. In 2011, IBM, under the, guy, the research, lead researcher who's also by the way in Wall Street, uh, Dave Ferrucci was the lead guy at the time. He was in IBM re at IBM Research, and he said, "Look, like we'll just deconstruct the game of Jeopardy, and we'll get uh, a bunch of uh, blade, you know, uh, supercomputers to play it." And um, those kind of successes create all this excitement in the media, and everybody thinks, "Okay." And it's like in the meantime, nobody can have can talk to Alexa. Right, and it's so glaringly obvious. It's just unbelievable. It's like, look, you know, I, I could, I didn't give you the argument for the book. I sorry, I, I need to actually transition to that very quick. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes? Okay. So, um, so I'm gonna. I don't have any time. I have to do this weird transition now and just explain. So, when you. Uh, when you talk about AI, you're talking about the ability to infer something. So any system, if it's cognitive at all, if it's a person, machine, anything, if it's intelligent at all, it has to be able to take what it already knows and what it can see around it and make, an, make a conclusion about what's coming next. You can't get down, you can't have a robot deployed to get down to the QFC right over here if it can't make a series of inferences about what's going on in the sidewalk. It, uh, similarly, in natural language, if you want to have Alexa actually understand what you mean, she, need, she needs to make it, needs to make inferences constantly about what is implied but not said in a stream of tokens, which we call natural language. So wherever we see our own human intelligence, we have this question of how do you leap forward and make an inference? And it turns out that the inferences that we uh, have, we, that we know a lot about, going all the way back to Aristotle, we can program. But they're not the inferences that generate intelligence, right? So we have deductive systems roughly in the classical period of AI. We have inductive systems roughly since the year 2000, really. It's so nice that it just is this, this new century that we have induction. Induction is classically described by, say you observe white bird, white swans, white swans. Remember the guy, Talib, who said the black swan? In 2007, he wrote a book about induction and said, look, it only takes one example to invalidate the entire inference. That's all the big data stuff that we're doing now is basically just counting. 
And you're saying like the more frequency we have, the more confidence we have to make the inference. So if you have any exception or hint, hint, innovation, innovation, you can't capture it with big data. You can't. So we can program induction. That's big data, AI, what we have today. We can program deduction, which is all people are mortal. Socrates is a person, therefore Socrates is mortal. It gives you absolute confidence in your conclusion, but you need to make sure that your premises are absolutely true, and very little in the world is absolutely true. So we have problems building AI off of that foundation. We have problems building AI off of the big data or inductive foundation. And there's a third type of inference, which has been studied by mathematicians for a, long, a very long time. It's called abduction or hypothesis generation. And it's probably what a lot of you are doing right now, which is like, what is he, what is he driving at? Like you're making a, you're, you're forming a question. The question is like, where did that question come from? It wasn't on the basis of hearing these sorts of discussions a million times before and then computing the most probable likelihood that I'm going to say cat or dog. It's not based on that. It's based on the fact that your mind is doing something interesting. And, you know, um, shout, shout out again um, to, to, to George Gilder because that, that spark of innovation is really what um, always we need. And the irony is, is we need it to complete the AI project. <laughs> the ultimate irony is we need human innovation to figure out how to compute how to make general intelligence on a computer if that's what we want to do. But make no mistake that the, the, the AI we have today is inadequate for that task and it will continue to be that way until the whole thing crashes again and we're, and we're back in a situation of no confidence. I think it's, we're right on the verge right now. So I hope I did a good job. Thank you. We, we do have some time for questions. And, and George, uh, you said at the outset that you maybe disagreed. So if you could not tackle him in the same way that you did our former Speaker of the House and say what you disagree with, that would be good. Do you want to spar a little bit with Eric? I tried to make my message as consistent as possible with yours so that this didn't happen. <laughs> no, no, it's, I, it's I, okay. This is, this is Steve's. I, I, I'm just in, I, I'm inciting I wonder this. whether the only point I make, I concluded from your book that, uh, a, that general intelligence uh, described as Peter Thiel did, for example, is fundamentally impossible. That, that for a, a machine, that uh, a machine is uh, governed by uh, uh, the Turing rule and uh, the, at Bletchley Park, the, uh, based on Gödel uncertainty, based on Peirce's uh, view that uh, reality is triadic. You you have maps, you have territories, but you need a mediator, an intelligent mediator which, or, or as Turing put it, an oracle, which cannot be a machine. And uh, so I concluded that uh, you don't really believe we can build this uh, singulatarian artificial intelligence. Uh, but, uh, uh, but Harvard doesn't like that. What? So. Harvard, Harvard, doesn't ha Harvard doesn't like that, so. Okay. Well, that, that's my only question. Whether you believe it's fundamentally impossible and misconceived as a goal, and actually, I think self-defeating and distracting for, uh, for uh, great teams of workers at Apple and Google and Microsoft and wherever, or whether, uh, whether actually this maybe impossible goal can actually animate productive research and development. Yeah. Why don't you respond, and then if there are other questions, uh, come forward. Go ahead. Eric. No, I, look, so I, I appreciate you getting me to speak in public about something that I don't want to talk about. So <laughs> thanks, thanks for that. <laughs> um, 
I, I do think that there's something um, irreducible. Uh, I, I, I have a very strong sense that that project is doomed to failure, actually. Unfortunately, I work and my colleagues don't like it when you, if you're training for a marathon and you say, I don't think we'll ever make it to 26, it's, it's, not, it's not very psychologically uh, motivating for people. So um, <clears throat> I do, I do uh, use the, the innovation card to talk about, yeah, but there does seem to be something irreducible about the action of mind in the, in the physical world. Um, it's very puzzling how that, how that actually works, and it's very unclear how we're going to reduce that to Python or C++ or C. I, 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 I suspect that uh, um, that, that project will um, not be met with success, actually. I, I, I do suspect that that's true, but I also don't have a crystal ball, so, yeah. So my, my 22 year old son and I had a conversation a few years ago about machine learning, artificial intelligence, and we came to the conclusion that uh, true artificial intelligence uh, is not possible unless and until a machine can be rationally irrational, meaning that a machine can look at all the data and the data tell it to do one thing and it actually does something else rationally, not just based on some you know random chance. I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, that's the penetration, right? Like, so there's this thing with nature that's very curious, and the smartest people in the world um, have been trying to understand this going back all the way to you know, Aristotle, into the modern period, and so on. The penetration of mind into nature is very curious. And so one of the key features of when you have mind penetrating into nature is, is that something can act without an immediate causal precedent that can only be understood ex post facto or after the fact. And in fact, we do this all the time. It's amazing when you start to just decompose actually just how we talk to each other and get, you know, we talk, you know, hi, hi honey and so on and so forth. Like so much of that actually is not understandable in terms of a causal determinant before. And it's the, it is in the nature of computation as a formal system that it has to have that, right? Like the finite state automata is simply that there is a definable, immediate and identifiable, isolatable state. So I think that's a good, your, to answer your question, I think that's a good criteria, right? That what you, just, I'm sorry, but just let me just, one other thing. What, what happens when you argue about this with people, with my colleagues in AI and so on, is if you're just at all imprecise with your language, they will use that to, to basically bludgeon you for two hours in a, <laughs> right? So you have to be very, very specific about what you mean by mind penetrating into nature. And so that's kind of why I introduced the inference framework because this is something that everyone that, that actually works on AI knows is undergirding the project. Thank you for your question. Yeah, I'm with you. I like your perspective. Uh, you know, Socrates says the, the more we learn, the more we know we don't know. Yeah. And if you start with that, and there's two problems on the AI scene. One is dealing with the mind and memory. Like, memory is the most fundamental thing we can think about, but we don't know what it is. We don't know how it's stored. We could never upload it like Kurzweil thinks we can because we don't know what it is or where it is and how we get to it. So that's a problem right there, was just mind and memory. The second problem is that an age old problem in computer science, I'm sure you're thinking about this, this is something in my research. Uh, in AI, and that's the, the, the problem of uh, machine interpretability. So this has been around for 60 years. If machines, if we can't understand what machines are doing, machines can't understand what they're doing. Like when uh, the web was generated or created in 1999, eight years later, Tim Berners-Lee said, I kind of let the horse out of the barn. Machines can't read the web, right? Sure. And so machine interpretability is a problem. And so when we look at AI, We've got the black box problem and we can't know what it's doing. And it seems to me, and what I'm doing my research on is, we need to make sure that when humans delegate things to machines, we know what the machines are doing, they can tell us. So it's kind of a para-intelligence versus artificial intelligence. Curious on your comments on that. Right, so it's interesting about TBL. So, I mean, you know that he spearheaded the semantic web. Yep. And, you know, that, it's funny. I, it went nowhere. It went nowhere. And, and part of the problem is, is that if you try to express 
what you know yep. in a deductive language. So if you put it in RDF or RDF yeah, schema, exactly. I can tell you're technical. So sorry, everyone. But like, if you if you do that and then you generate forward consequences yeah. in an inference engine, it turns out that most of the stuff right. that you care about is actually not captured in those axioms. And the interesting and thing about that, that's why it failed. Yeah. So you, you use the same term I use in my work. It's ex post facto. It's yeah. out of the aftermath. Yeah. And Tim Berners Lee thought he could put RDF inside of HTML after there's a billion pages already RDF. generated. Yeah, RDF. After there's a after the uh, there's a billion pages generated. So what what is RDF? Oh, George is mad at oh, us. Oh, sorry about it. <laughs> resource description format. All right. Yeah, it's a it's a, a way of putting semantics into HTML. The problem with that is that the horse left, and so what you have to do is you have to work. You, you realize when you work with the web, it's implicit knowledge. We can look at any page and understand it, but machines can't. So you have to take an ex post facto out of the aftermath approach, build models that can do that, and that's. And that's why I look at para-intelligence as a way that humans work with, it. not really AI, but we can call it that because we're amongst friends. Absolutely, and so one thank way, you. one way, thank you, by the way. Um, so one way of sort of capturing the insight there is, there's a big push now for explainable AI. So you start with a black box, which is deep learning, which is a kind of neural network. It's a it's a, it's a basically it's a lot of statistical curve fitting, right? So you have a bunch of data and you have to figure out what the distribution of points are that you're interested in, so that you can identify a face or uh, a stream of language, right? And so you have that that kind of uh, that kind of situation, but nobody knows why it made the decision that it made. It's just. It's like uh, if you go back to the Middle Ages, we're close to where we are right now. You just say, "Look, this is this is how it works," and so what are the what what's the explanation for the rational mind, so that we can build the society together? We don't know. It's like there's just this oracle now, and when you when what the the question was, uh, we had an approach that's explainable. We actually could understand the logic if you could decompose it. The problem is, is that it doesn't work. So you have this kind of horns of, the, the, of a dilemma with AI where you have stuff that we can understand because it sort of tracks cognitively with what we do. It's rule-based, right? Okay, I did this, and I did this, and I did this, but it doesn't generate intelligence. And then in a, in a narrow sense, we have this sort of black box medieval thing that Moore's Law made possible, and it gives us results in some circumstances, some of the time, but we have no idea why it made the decision. And how can you base, so if you go into a safety domain and you have a self-driving car, right? How can you say, we have this black box. It's just this crabby person that we don't know why he or she makes the decisions they make. They might as easily think that the school bus full of your children is a bridge as anything else. And if it drives into the school bus and kills everybody, there's no way to reconstruct or hold it accountable in a court of law, morally, because we just don't know why it made that decision. It was 100 million pixel points on a huge vector space that nobody can understand with the human mind. So if you're, if you're gonna offload human culture into something that we don't understand and occasionally is, it kills everyone, you're pretty close to the worst society in the world, actually. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's I, I can't even like, think of something like, worse than that. That's like. I almost said, that's like my ex-marriage, but like, okay. <laughs> so so, so that, that is the situation though, and the, 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 the question was very well posed, but it invoked some technical vocabulary, but we had another way of doing this, but it just doesn't work as well as the moronic medieval black box works. <laughs> so bad choices, and here we have our own thinking to rely on, we should probably maybe not give up on that so soon. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate the opportunity. Oh, yeah.